Hello everyone, welcome to Your Questions on Astrology Part 2. A little bit of a delay answering these, but I'm on my way with some long videos for you coming up soon. Don't forget to continue to post below as I'm still taking questions for future editions in this series. So a general question on astrology, please put below this video. So let's continue on with the questions which you've already asked me. If you are new to my channel, don't forget to sub below. Let's go. So let's begin with a question from Manasvini who said, what does Jupiter Atma Kalika really mean for a person? I've only read very narrow interpretations and it's a topic that is hard to find information for online that is relevant to present time. Well, thank you very much indeed for that question. But I have a question for you and indeed for everybody listening. Is Jupiter actually your Atma Kalika? Does everybody know what their Atma Kalika is? Well, if you are using seven karakas, it may be inaccurate, I humbly put to you. Now, you know, I'm just a person who just says what I think in regard to so many things. Everybody, I used to use the seven karakas, excluding Rahu, and it didn't work. And I was had so many reasons not to put in Rahu. I resisted and resisted. As you know, I follow Pandit Sanjay Rath and he used eight and for so long I resisted until I eventually put in eight and everything fell into place. <laughs> if you only use seven karakas, everybody, something's missing. It could be father, it could be varna, it could be your society, it could be lots of things. I use eight now and Rahu has made everything make sense. Now he becomes my daughter Karaka. It's perfect. Everything makes perfect sense all the book teas work everything works so i would humbly say put rahu in just see where he goes in the in the whole system and make sure that you remember that he's actually going backwards everybody so a high degree would be zero one two three degrees etc for rahu and a low degree would be 29, 28, 27, etc. So if Jupiter is your Apmakarika, yes, we can judge from this because the actual planet means misdeeds, you see, because Apmakarika is the highest karma, the highest degree of any planet in any sign. The highest degree means the more karmas you have. I've actually got a Mahadasha video where I talk about the degree of the planet have a check below and there I talk about the amount of trash you have to burn everybody we are burning our trash with our atmakarika it's painful it's painful in the Mahadasha there is no remedy for atmakarika people say oh give me remedy for shani shani remedy gemstone gemstone and yes shani has very difficult karmas and by sign again I'll be putting up a big long video soon for you with that I'm currently looking at that. It's amazing, isn't it? Saturn's karmas are the most challenging, we often think, until we run the dasha of our Atmakarika. <laughs> until we run the dasha, or bhukti indeed, of our Atmakarika, but mostly the actual Mahadasha. My goodness, we get the karmas. Yeah, we get the karmas. So Jupiter means guru. Jupiter means teacher. So some misdeeds in regard to teachings listening to teachers, respecting teachers, being humble to teachers, following teachers, all of these things. So you will find the need to be that in this lifetime. From a very early age, you'll feel the need to listen, to inquire. You will, you will absolutely feel that this is your karma. Okay, but you have to look in the house position, the sign position. Let me tell you one little secret finally, everybody. The sixth house from your Atmakarika and the eighth house, your soul doesn't like to go there because Atmakarika is your soul. The sixth house and the eighth house terrify your Atmakarika and things don't work out. So don't force things in those areas. Let them be. Maybe they're not meant to work out. That's the way it's meant to be. I hope that was useful for you. So I have an interesting question, everybody, from Antoli Malakoff. Antoli says, I was wondering about the relocation chart. 
when you change your residence according to astro cartography you change the ascendant so which chart i have to check natal or the relocated chart thank you for that question now astro cartography was very popular in the western system at one time 1980s and just in case you don't know what it is everybody it's if you go far enough to live from where you were actually born, it could be argued you now have a new ascendant because at that new location, a different sign was actually rising at the time you were born. So say you're born in New York and you've got Leo rising. When you go somewhere else, you might have Taurus rising or any other sign and so on. So are you really having a new birth chart is the question. It's highly controversial. As I've experienced it when it was a big rage, you know, and I was traveling at different places in the world, you definitely get a different feeling of yourself in a new location. But how long before your old self surfaces? Some people have said it's not long. It can take six months, a year of living there or maybe even longer and you feel, mm, I'm feeling more like my old self again now. I see the astro cartography ascendant, this relocation chart, as a superficial imposition onto your real birth chart. That's my opinion on it. So to judge everything from this new chart, I think would be a big mistake. You can't just dump your chart the moment you were born. That's that's your... um. That's your contract for this life. That's what your birth chart is. You don't get a new contract just because you're going to live somewhere else. If you do relocate successfully and stay somewhere for a long period of time, you are meant to be there. That's your karma to be there, to meet who you're going to meet, to do what you are going to do. And all of that is already in your actual chart, birth chart. So don't dump your lagna of birth. You need to judge all of your transits from your birth chart as normal, I would say. And certainly, Mahadashas from all of those birth chart Baba Cusps, absolutely. If you want to superimpose this extra chart, please do. But don't leave behind birth chart. Ne never do that. You won't be able to. Furthermore, your moon likeness stays the same. Rarely it might move a little bit by a degree or so, but it normally stays the same sign. So same moon chart, same sun chart normally, but different Lagna chart, not really. It's a superficial imposition. It can never change your real destiny. That is my opinion on this. So here as Khan has a question, what about evil eye and jinxing? Is it something that Vedic astrology takes into account? Thank you for the question. Well, if you were coming from Western astrology to Vedic astrology, and I know many of my listeners are, my goodness, you would be like hit by all of this constant talk about curse yoga, like Shani Rahu, Shani Ketu, curse yoga, former lithics Kandara, curse yoga. You think, what on earth is all this cursing? Where's it all coming from? Am I cursed? No, you're not. You see, everybody, curses are nothing more than our own deeds coming back to us. And on this little clip now that I'm now recording, I'm going to give you what I have found the best remedy for these yogas. So stay with this. Yeah, curses are nothing but our own deeds coming back to us. So we should not think that somebody has had the power to cause us to suffer. Not in this age of Kali. This is not possible. Only exalted beings can curse. Really exalted beings. You see, every day we are walking around cursing, aren't we? I got up this morning and there was something on the radio about local politics or national politics in the UK and I was cursing and cursing. You know, <laughs> I won't talk about it. It's not worth it. But here's the thing, we're cursing every minute, aren't we? And when something difficult happens, like if you go onto relationship forums or things like this, you'll see people saying, I wish she would suffer the way she made me suffer or he would suffer the way he made me suffer or this and that. You know, people say these things because they are suffering, but their words don't have any power. 
because it's Kali Yoga and our words don't have that power. We have to be very careful in this age. I've, I've actually heard this and I know it's true. When we curse, because curses like chickens come home to roost. So what this actually means, everyone, is that when we curse other people, it comes back to us. That little arrow comes back and it pierces our own heart. We don't have the power to curse other people, nor should we even think of it. So don't be concerned that you have been cursed. It's only your deeds. The only people who can curse are those exalted beings. Like in, I think it's Shema Bhagavatam, that famous, beautiful story of baby Krishna. He was a little child and he pulled down two big trees. And from these trees came these beautiful demigods who had been cursed to live for goodness knows how long as trees. What had they done? Well, in the heavenly spheres, they were sporting in a lake with some of these maidens, heavenly maidens, and a very exalted sage arrived. Now, whereas all the maidens immediately covered themselves in shame, these two demigods continued on. And they did not cover themselves. So they were cursed by this exalted sage to become trees. Why trees? Because a tree is always naked and exposed. So that was a very good example of how exalted beings can curse. But we are not like that. So do not be afraid of this evil eye curse. Okay, it is simply our deeds. So what is the remedy for these difficult yogas, everybody? I'm not saying that any remedies which you've seen or read about are not useful, by the way, because I'm not saying that certain gemstones can't help you feel different. Saying mantras is always good. Mantra is always perfect. It helps us. It, it heals our mind. It takes away so much distress from our soul. Mantra is always good. Always, always good. But when we are suffering, the deepest remedy at all times that we should try to apply, it's absolutely free, is forgiveness. Yes, forgiveness. It's the purest tapasya and the hardest tapasya. When we are having difficult times and we just feel like, why is this happening? And we, and we are saying this person is to blame or that is to blame whatever has happened. If we try to forgive, even if we can't do it completely, but we make an effort, it's a marvelous remedy. I've heard people say how free they feel, how they feel a lightness in their being by this. Forgiveness is the deepest remedy, I promise you. It's really hard, though. It's the hardest of all the tapasias, but it is actually sad. That if you can forgive in some way, you get rid of so much of this difficult karma that you could not imagine. It really frees you and even generations back because many of these difficult karmas are coming in the family. They're coming on and on and on. Seven generations back, they say. So when you forgive, you are releasing ancestors also. So it's a marvelous thing, forgiveness, if we can just try. So I hope that was helpful in some way. Question from Felix Elgato, who says, how difficult is it to have a retrograde ascendant Lord? Thank you for that. Well, we can't just judge by retrograde ascendant Lord. So I'm going to use this as a way to talk about ascendant Lord itself. Retrograde simply means, as I take it, that you're coming back to finish something off. So if your ascendant Lord is retrograde, you have urgently taken birth to complete some karmas. This is how retrograde planets go. Let me tell you, have you ever been to the shops and you've come out of the shop and you've realized, oh, no, I forgot something. And you have to go back into the shop, anybody, anybody do that, especially when you've done a really big shop and you've got all of your list. Then you get to the car, you're unpacking the bags and all of a sudden you think, oh, no, I forgot this one item, whatever it is, you've forgotten it. How do you feel? What state do you get yourself into? You go into a hyper state, maybe depending on your personality and you rush back into that store. And are you focused? 
you are totally focused on that one item. You know exactly why you're there. You know exactly what you want. You, you don't become, you know, looking here, looking there. You are focused on that one item because you have come back to get that item. Well, that's what it's like having retrograde ascendant lord. You've taken birth with a mission. You've got one thing you have to accomplish. So rather than being a difficult thing from many angles, this is a boon because you you should be focused on that factor, of course. You have to look at the house, the sign and the aspects which can change it all. But on the whole, any retrograde planet gives urgent karma that has to be completed. You didn't finish off something in your last incarnation and you have come back urgently focused on that to complete it. So it's not a difficulty, it's a source of strength. I hope that was helpful. So I have a question from Saul who says, what are the things you should look into to find out about your career talents in your chart besides 10th house? Good question. But right away, I would say the 10th house shows what you're going to do. 10th house in your D1 chart shows what you will actually end up doing. Despite the fact you might not have talents in it, that's the sort of job you will do. And that 11th house is how much you will earn from that job. OK, but hopefully there's very often a link between the D10 and the D1. D10 ascendant, though I've seen this, D10 rising sign, planets rising, will always describe career. I've hardly ever seen that it does not show. OK, so if you have Mars in your D10 ascendant, you have some active career, maybe some sort of security person, army person, maybe sports or something very active. If you have maybe Jupiter rising, you're a teacher of some sort. You are giving guidance in some way. You can always see from the D10 or the Lord of that ascendant in that D10 what it is where it is placed in that D10 itself is helpful, very helpful, because that's what you end up doing. And you wouldn't do it if you didn't have talent in it. So it's a which comes first, really, isn't it? Talent or the job, job or the talent. They go together. But a final secret is a matchia karaka, the second highest planet in your chart. Now, at the beginning of this video, I talked about the Atma Karaka, didn't I? Your soul planet. And I said that I use the eight Karaka system. So I would always include Rahu in this Karaka calculation. So find that planet who is your second highest. That shows a deep talent. What you're really good at. This is the minister to the Atma Karaka. This is the real planet of deeds getting things done in your life. You have talent with that graha. Let's say it is Saturn. You have organizational skills. You have a really good systematic mind. You can instruct people because Saturn is instructor. So you have to go with that particular planet, Amatya Karaka, second highest planet. You definitely have talent there for sure. A question now from Vishnu T who says, why moon in Pisces aspected by Saturn has high emotional empathy, but a retrograde Saturn moon combination in the same leads to restricted emotional empathy? Well, thank you very much for that interesting question, Vishnu T. Now, I presume this is your chart. I'm not sure. And I presume that you mean Saturn moon conjunction. First of all, it's not the Pisces aspect at all that's the issue here. Moon in Pisces is going to give emotional empathy whether Saturn is there or not. It doesn't change it. But the moon conjunct Saturn has a specific factor and this is it. And by the way, retrograde Saturn makes no difference either. Retrograde simply means stronger Saturn, more karmas attached. That's all. So moon conjunct Saturn is the thing we have to analyze. Moon Saturn means 
lack of emotional nurturing very often early on. Needs for nurturance are not met. This can be mothering issues or circumstances in the early childhood environment. It can be many factors. But what tends to happen is a huge frustration. People who have moon Saturn end up feeling frustrated that their needs are not being met and they become detached emotionally from their own needs. Now, that's a different thing from lack of empathy. They still have empathy for other people. They're very caring, especially moon in Pisces, exceptionally caring. But there is this real feeling of frustration that needs are not being met. And this leads to a certain detachment through life. So that's what I've seen. So the retrograde Saturn makes no difference. It absolutely makes for stronger karmic factors. That's all. Question from Miss Seychelles who said, what happens when an old Mahadasha changes to a new one? So for instance, Jupiter Rahu to Saturn Saturn. What is the significance of this transformation and preparation period? Well, thank you very much for that question. And it's completely right what you say. It is a transformation and you do need to prepare. But most people, the end of every Mahadasha is frantic. It doesn't matter what the planet, what the final bhukti is, it's frantic. You lose control. You can't contain everything. You feel like things are coming at you from all quarters and you just can't make sense of your life. I've seen this. It doesn't really matter what Mahadasha, as I say, it's out of control. It's hard to make a transition at the last period of the Mahadasha. The best advice is to go with the flow, try to stay calm, try meditation. Not an easy time to meditate for many. Just try to stay calm because... The time when things will become under control is the new Mahadasha. That little period of time, now it all depends what it is. Say Jupiter, Jupiter is a longer period than say Mars, Mars. So the longer that first period is when it's the same planet like Venus, Venus, you know, whatever. You have time then to control things, to reflect, to make some choices, to make some really good transformations because once you've gone into that new energy it's a sort of a a calm before the storm even if it's a good storm it's a karma period most people find this okay so the new mahadasha the first bhukti which has the same two planets that's a time to take stock of your life to maybe make a new a plan for your life, at least have a direction for your life and gain a bit of control, which you lost at the last Mahadasha. So it is a preparation period, but you've got to take stock of the fact that the real Mahadasha doesn't really begin until that second bhukti. That's when things start to move. So don't expect things to move. I've seen people go through Mars, Mars, and move hell on earth to make things happen. And none of it works. And then they get into Mars, Rahu, and things just fall apart. Just completely fall apart. So Mars is a very difficult one to stay calm with, yeah? Because you just want to rush in where angels dare. Mars has that energy. But if Mars is really positive for you, it could work. It's always individual. Can I just make a point to everybody about Mars Dasha to Rahu? If any of you have been through this, let me know, because honestly, this is one of the most difficult um, periods for many people, Mars to Rahu particularly, okay? Because at the end of Mars, you're in Mars moon, and Mars moon can be super successful for some people very often, or super just really bad, you know, super bad, basically. So, and then you go into Rahu, Rahu. And what tends to happen is because Rahu is the north node of the moon, it continues that moon bhukti theme. So if it was a really good Mars moon, you will get a really good Rahu, Rahu. It just continues on like it's more the same, getting better and better. You think it's never going to end. And then Rahu, Jupiter, it changes. Suddenly, be prepared for that. 
And if it's been really bad and you've had a really bad Mars moon period, many people do. And then you go into Rahu Rahu. You think it's never going to end. You think this is going to go on forever. There is just no end. But then Rahu Jupiter comes and it changes for you too. That's a more welcome change. So this can often happen. But again, you cannot make a complete generalization. Please, we have to check what is Rahu for you and what is Mars for you. But that's just one example of how things can move on like that. But yes, you're right. We need to prepare. We need to be aware that our life is going to change. When we look back, we will think, my life was not the same after this Mahadasha took hold of my destiny. So I hope that was a useful answer for your question. Again, any concerns post below. Anyone wants to comment on that, particularly being through Mars Rahu, I'd be very interested to hear about that as well. So I have a question from Space Blue who says, can you please elaborate on how Saturn Mars opposition plays out? I'm having a hard time finding information on this subject. Well, thank you very much, Space Blue, for that question, because Saturn Mars needs to be understood. It's not a great a difficulty as people think. There are some issues. Let's go through them. We need to understand the energy first. Saturn is the actual sorrow of the defeated one, they say. And Mars is the joy of the victorious one. There's a completely different dynamic, isn't there? Mars is the warrior. He's all for attack, attack and victory, victory. Nothing will stop him. He might retreat for a while, but only to plan the next attack. He's always forward motion. Saturn is retreat, more pragmatic. Saturn doesn't want to fight. Saturn wants to meditate in the forest, really. Saturn is the loner. So a completely different energy. And what tends to happen when you have a conjunction or indeed opposition? It's just the same. Don't think it's it's a completely different thing. It's a merging of these two dynamics. You get frustration because it's a push and a pull. It's a fast forward and then a retreat all the time. So you find lots of limitations when you begin things. There's, you know, loads of obstacles, all of these karmic factors coming from Saturn. But in time, you can learn to live with this frustration and you can become very successful. Many successful people have this and they can work in any industry at all. In fact, often in the industrial sector, they can be very successful. OK, because Mars is a builder and Saturn is about you know, sort of really making things work long term. So Mars and Saturn go together in a very constructive way over time. You can become very strategic, a very good strategist, and you know how to make things work for you. You can defeat enemies with this, definitely, because of your maneuvering around all of the obstacles. People never know what you're going to do next. It's very good for that sort of thing. So particularly politicians can do very well with this Mars Saturn. So it takes a bit of time though. You need Saturn to mature at 36 and it can become very good indeed. Finally though, when you've got a transit of this, we all need to be careful because Saturn Mars can be accidents because Mars is moving forward fast and Saturn is a sudden stop and that's the accident so we have to be aware of it okay when we have a mars saturn in our skies in any way we have to look out for that so i hope that was helpful for you so final question on this video everybody is about the d60 chart well i have two questions actually msyk says how do i find out if i was male or female in my d60 chart past life and somebody else i'm sorry i've lost your name but somebody else asked about how do I rectify D60 as it changes every two minutes? Well, everybody, the D60, the Shasti I'm sure is a beautiful chart, isn't it? But not all of us have an accurate Shasti I'm sure. And it's a shame because it can be very helpful. But I think we can do good Vedic astrology without it. So if you can't rectify, don't be too panicked about it. I have to be honest and say I don't know an accurate system of rectification that 
I can actually say guarantees works. You see, rectification, I've tried different systems various times. In my old astrology, in the Western astrology, I would use a Uranus transit and it was very, very good. Uranus to your moon. I devised this myself and it really worked for, you know, this was only to find ascendant sign. OK, because the moon is always shifting every you know hour or so. And it was very, very helpful because Uranus events are very good timing events. So the thing is about any system of rectification, particularly fine tuning like this, you need to live your life. You need to have events happening. So real rectification. I think it has to be VIA events in your life. Anybody knows the method? Post below. I'm sorry, I, I cannot answer that really for you. Nor can I tell you whether you're male or female according to your D6D. I haven't heard of any definite technique that would actually work there. Again, if anybody knows, it would be really good to hear about that. I can't see how that could be. The thing is about this, though, if you are lucky enough to have your D60 chart, please just be glad to have it because I'm now going to give you a great secret about the D60, everybody. So I hope this will make up for that for you. OK, at least if you do have. Don't forget about 50 percent of human beings do not have an accurate D60 anyway. But if you do, here it is. D60 is your past life as a human being, okay, your last life, human life. And those karmas are not all coming through into this incarnation. Only a few of them. How do you know? A great secret from Pandit Sanjay Rath. It actually goes like this. Anything which has come through into the D9 chart from the D60 is mega big. So let's say you got Mars in Sagittarius in your D60. And you've also got Mars in Sagittarius in your D9, Navamsa. It's going to be big. Mahadash is going to be huge. It's going to be a turning point, mega karma. It could be really good. It could be really bad. And generally, Mars is challenging for sure. But you have to look at house position and so on. OK, so that's a mega good secret. It has to come through. That D60 has to come through into your D9. Same planet, same sign. Not the D1 in the Navamsa D9. That was a really good secret. I hope that's useful for you. I have also found that the rising sign of your D60 says a lot about who you were, the sort of individual you were, and any planet rising that particular graha is mega important in this life as well. So those particular mahadashas also are crucial. I hope that was useful in some way. So that's the end of those questions, everybody. For this time, if you have more questions, please continue to post below this video. I look forward to answering those in the near future. Goodbye for now and God bless you all.